This talk is dedicated to the 115 Columbia University art history graduate students who wrote a letter to the art history faculty during the summer of 2020 asking that the department advance the cause of social justice. Many, if not most, collections of Impressionism originate in personal motives. As Baudrillard so memorably said, one always collects oneself. Putting aside the biographical details of collectors' histories, consider their hopes for immortality through donations of Impressionist paintings, prints, drawings, or sculptures to public institutions. Kai Butt's great 1894 donation of 68 of his colleagues' paintings to the French state, with Renoir as his executor, comes immediately to mind, along with Monet's 1891 subscription campaign to donate Manet's Olympia to the French state. And Havemeyer's great 1929 donation to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, which included works by Manet, Monet, Degas, and Cézanne. Scholars continue to discover new personal dimensions to these donations of Impressionism, notably Gloria Groom and Catherine Krenmetzer on the occasion of the current exhibition at the Art Institute of Chicago, Monet and Chicago, witness the prominence of Bertha and Potter Palmer's photographs on these pages. Or James Macaulay, in his forthcoming book, House of Fragile Things, who investigates the donation of Impressionist works by Isaac de Camondeau. The hopes collectors of Impressionism have had for themselves and for the reputation of Impressionism have always been predicated on the civic foundations of the museum. Habermas, Foucault, and many others have pointed out that the public functions, the public sphere, requires institutions, of which the museum, Bennett observed, is one of the most important. Each of the examples of collecting and donating Impressionism already mentioned demonstrates not only a personal motive, but also a desire to enlarge a public's critical capacity. Well aware of the stylistic and ideological challenges the finest Impressionist art presented in its moment, each of these donors hoped to push a public toward the acceptance of new ideas. Monet, for instance, hoped that the collective pressure of a subscription toward the purchase of Olympia by many prominent French intellectuals would force the acceptance of a modernist aesthetic. Perhaps, though we cannot be certain, Monet also hoped the painting would force a greater acceptance of the critical attitude toward modern life represented by Manet's exploration of the sexual politics of modern urban prostitution. Such faith in the civic utility of difficult art was entirely appropriate to the collection of Impressionism. The movement itself had struck a remarkable balance between individualism and collective aspiration. Each of the Impressionists had a distinctive artistic character, yet in shifting configurations, each of them participated in the Impressionist exhibitions and in modes of sociability that consolidated professional alliances. A uniquely creative and original mind made each of the great Impressionists profoundly individual. Yet the recognition that they shared this trait bound them together. Entirely in keeping with the generation that took France through and out of Napoleon III's autocracy into the Third Republic, the Impressionists cultivated a resistance to orthodox thought and believed in the civic necessity of skepticism. How else to come out from under an imperial regime and into elected government? How else to challenge the tenets of the Académie des Beaux-Arts and inaugurate modernism? The hallmark of the greatest Impressionist works is just this sort of resistance to convention, along with the proposal of alternatives. 
Olympia has continued to provide us with alternatives ever since it was made. Just recently, in 2018 and 2019, the painting yielded new race critique through Denise Morell's scholarship and an exhibition that traveled and morphed from Columbia University's Wallach Art Gallery to the Musée d'Orsay to Acte Memorial in Guadeloupe. Earlier, Olympia had yielded important class critique from social art historians and then strong gender critique from feminist art historians. We have been reminded by Olympia three times over of Impressionism's ability to call anything and everything into question. Among Impressionist paintings which tested the limits of collection, my current personal favorite is Cassatt's 1883 Lady at a Tea Table in the collection of the Met. The painting was intended to be a gift to women in Cassatt's family in exchange for their gift of a Japanese tea set. In her painting, Cassatt expressed her skepticism, however, about tea sets and tea rituals, lace, porcelain, and cosmetic beauty standards. She contradicted what was supposed to be pretty, dainty, neat, and tight with a bold, gestural, abstracting impressionist painting technique. She flaunted her identification with the authorial individualism of impressionist style. In so doing, she rebelled against the gendered social expectations of her extended family and suffered their refusal of the painting. Mrs. Riddle, the subject of the portrait along with her daughter, would not accept the gift. They could have politely accepted it and then tossed it away, but no, they had to insult Cassatt. Luckily, Cassatt's mother and Durga supported Cassatt and defended the painting. No wonder, actually, though, that Cassatt's conventionally feminine family members refused the painting. An unflattering picture of Mrs. Riddle's face was the least of the painting's offenses against society's conventions. Fundamentally, Cassatt was refusing the masculine gendering of professionalism, creativity, wit, and skepticism itself. This painting, together with a career's worth of attention to Morisot, has convinced me that the most modern and daring of all the Impressionists were actually the women among them, because they were the ones who called into question the most fundamental organizing principle of mainland French society, its division into masculine versus feminine. No wonder then that donations of Impressionist art to state collections were often resisted. Impressionism was troubling. Caillebotte's bequest was not accepted without strenuous argument, and then only partially. Macaulay's new book on French Jewish art collectors, notably Isaac de Camondo, makes us painfully aware that donations to France by its Jewish citizens were frequently mocked by anti-Semites. Nor, as Macaulay reminds us, did generous donation to France of Impressionist art keep the families of Jewish donors from being murdered during the Holocaust with the willing collaboration of the Vichy regime. Let us not forget, however, that the Impressionists themselves sometimes internalized social conventions. Degas became an anti-Semite and crossed the street rather than greet Pizarro. Morisot encouraged Monet to take the lead public role in the campaign to buy Olympia for the state rather than conduct the campaign herself. We have evidence that she was a driving force behind this, the scenes, but she herself clearly deferred to Monet, who did, I must add, have the courtesy to ask for her approval in the end when the painting hung on museum walls. Cassatt was mortified by her family's refusal of Lady at a Tea Table. She hid the painting for decades. At the same time, some obstinate individuals in the Impressionist world valiantly refused to accept social rules. They put pressure on other individuals and on public institutions or the state. Havemeyer, for instance, in the service of the women's suffrage movement, organized an exhibition of work by Degas and Cassatt in 1915 and pressured Cassatt 
to take Lady at a tea table out of hiding for it. Havemeyer then pressured Cassatt to give the painting to the Met. Caillebotte had included work by none of his women colleagues in the collection he bequeathed to the French state. But Maurice friends, Morizot's friends noticed and organized to give one of her paintings at around the same time. So strong was the resistance to Caillebotte's quest that the painting by Morizot actually ended up entering a state collection first. Those who donated difficult, troubling works did so because they believed in the future. They had the confidence to imagine that in the future, ideas would be different. Better, they had the confidence to move works of art into the public domain in order to help make change happen. The very act of donation implies a vision for the future, a belief that in the public domain, works of art will eventually change people's minds. The movement of collections into the public sphere of museums allows public pressure to relay, supplement, or redirect private pressures. The anthropologist Apaterai has memorably called the history of objects the social life of things. We've tended to think that the social life of art things ends when they enter museums. Museums do promise to withdraw art from public markets and to keep them perpetually safe. From an anthropologist's point of view, museums certainly do withdraw art from many forms of social and economic exchange. From an art historical point of view, however, the collection of art by museums accelerates the social life of art things. In museums, opportunities to alter the meanings of works of art expand. Qualitatively, the ways in which museums choose to publish, label, research, and exhibit their collections can produce radically new meanings for existing objects. Quantitatively, those meanings reach ever-expanding audiences in galleries through programming and now online. New audiences continue to be invoked by and summoned to collections in the museum. Look at the Musée d'Orsay in one recent season, the summer of 2019, the Modèle Noir exhibition and the first truly national exhibition of a woman artist overlapped. Musée d'Orsay director Laurence Descartes and curators Sylvie Patry, Cécile Debray and Isolde Plutermacher achieved heroic breakthroughs. And luckily, not long before COVID-19 closed down public access to museums all over the world. Let us take some advantage of the pause that COVID-19 has imposed on all of us to think hard about how we want to proceed when our world opens up again. In the United States especially, where the unequal effects of COVID-19 have been so pronounced, there have been dramatic calls for social justice and for deep change in all domains. Our moment is being called a plastic moment one in which we can imagine greater change than in any normal time. Now is a moment to embrace change in the meanings of collections. A plastic moment is the right one in which to call for a fundamental conceptual change, even if it entails major institutional reorganization, even if it entails the elimination of some institutions. This conference is supposed to be about the collection of impressionism, but that subject itself acts as a boundary I am about to call into question. I've become skeptical of a subject called the collection of impressionism. I no longer believe, as I once did in the boundaries that protect impressionism within museum galleries of European paintings at the Met, for instance. I no longer believe, as I once did in the boundaries that protect Impressionism within the Musée d'Orsay. I'm not here to impugn the origins of those boundaries. I'm not here to lament the past, nor do I want to spend energy on endless critiques of the past. I'm here to ask what effects the boundaries around Impressionism have on our society in the present. More urgently, 
I'm here to ask what effect those boundaries will have on our future. Because this is a conference on the collection of Impressionism, let me start here by addressing the era and the place of Impressionism, which is to say late 19th century France. Let me further concentrate on the greatest collections of that period, those in Paris, and on at least one of the greatest collections of Impressionism in the United States. What effect does it have on us that we have a Musée d'Orsay, which houses collections of late 19th century art, and then also on the Seine, but in a completely different building, the Musée Quai which also houses collections of late 19th century art. In one collection are works by white people. In the other, works by people of color. In one collection are those who did the collecting. In the other museum, those who were collected. Lines as thick as museum walls separate the two. In one collection are works of art made by people who were full French citizens. In the other collection are works of art taken by people who were full French citizens in the name of France. We have boundaries with museums between art that is made and art that is taken. But they are both French collections. They are both effects of the French aesthetics of the late 19th century. They are both parts of one French culture the same French culture that produced the creative genius of the Impressionists and the colonial genius of the military, ethnographic, and anthropological missions that took art from its places of creation and claimed them for France. It is the same culture that fostered the private dealers and the private collectors who acquired some of the objects now in the Musée Quai who moved them through countless channels into public collections, and now into the Musée Quai If they are possessions of the French state, then they belong within the same French history that gave us Impressionism. Very recently, French courts reaffirmed the ownership by the Musée Quai of its collection when it fined would-be removers of art objects from the museum and classified that action as robbery then let France assume responsibility for the Frenchness of its Quai collection. I don't want to seem to be designating only France or French museums. The same effect, or at least a similar one, is produced now for our moment by the separation of Impressionist works of art in galleries dedicated to European paintings in museums like the Met, while late 19th century works of art by people of color are exhibited in galleries called African or oceanic. In the most extreme case in New York City, we have late 19th century works by the Northwest Indian peoples in a museum called the Museum of Natural History, right across Central Park from the Met, yet so far apart conceptually. The distinction, like the distinction between the Musée d'Orsay and the Musée Quai Brandy, is according to who made those works of art. But by separating art according to who made it, we are now denying that they are united by the culture, the society, that did both the making and the taking. To collect Impressionism in 2020 and going forward must be to ask how museums will represent the era of Impressionism in the future. What responsibilities for a vision of our heritage Will the state take in France, where the great museums are ultimately run by the state? What responsibilities will trustees, directors, and curators take in the United States, where museums are essentially privately run? This question is all the more appropriate to ask, however, of French museums, because an important discussion has been broached in France recently through the pioneering Sar Savoie report, which involves the Musée Quai this discussion asks us how we want to collect in the future and what we want museums to become. The 2018 Sars Savoir report on the possible restitution of works of art to Africa, notably from the Musée Quai 
did an extraordinary job of rethinking the philosophical concepts underlying possession and restitution. The report brilliantly questions the assumption that all works of art believe in museums. Perhaps some works of art, the report suggests, need to circulate again in the sorts of circuits of education and exhibition that are now operating in the geographic locations from which works of art were taken, regardless of whether those circuits are museums as Europeans define museums. Perhaps they belong in schools, for instance. The Sao Savoie report, however, because it focuses on restitution, leaves in place a crucial assumption. The assumption that there should be two museums of 19th century art along the Seine. One, the Musée Quai Branly, the other, the Musée d'Orsay. My role here is not to argue for or against restitution, but rather to suggest that restitution is not the only tactic that museums could pursue in the future. Alongside the possibility of restitution, I want to suggest a reorganization of collections within French museums, one that directly involves Impressionism. Whatever its good intentions, whatever its past meanings, the Musée Quai Branly is in effect for our moment and moving forward, a monumental form of racial segregation. Its separation from the Musée d'Orsay is now, in and of itself, a segregation founded on inequality. So are distinctions in a museum like the Met between galleries dedicated to the effects of the culture on the art of white people and the effects of that same culture on the art of people of color? Any collection of art by human hands in a museum called a natural history museum is now, in our moment, a practice beyond redemption. The art made by the Northwest peoples in the collection of the Museum of Natural History in New York, for instance, belong alongside Impressionism. The collection of Impressionism in our time, for our time, demands a dissolution of a separate Musée Quai Branly and the integration of late 19th century art, perhaps in the Musée d'Orsay, perhaps redistributed in some other way. The making and the taking of art need to be seen together in the same galleries, in the same museum. They are parts of the same history. Edward Said, the great theorist of Orientalism, called for a contrapuntal history. In a contrapuntal collection of art, we should be able to see the causes and the effects of a culture's aesthetic power dynamics and relationships. We need to see the making and the taking together. The Enkizi sculptures of Central Africa together with Impressionism. Moves have been made in this direction by some museums. Curiously, these have often been in the areas of 17th and 18th century art or of 20th century art rather than for the 19th century. In this evocative remake by Hank Willis, skewed toward Belgium's colonial history, of the canonical Alfred Barr chart of abstract arts lineage skewed toward Belgium's colonial history, because Willis made it for a Belgian context, we only get a slice of how we could rethink Impressionism in its, impression, in its French context. Over the summer of 2020, the British Museum reinstalled its bust of slave-owning founder Hans Sloan, and now the text of its website is far more historically inclusive than it once was. Many galleries devoted to porcelain now exhibit Chinese, Japanese, and European porcelains together in order to exhibit the relationships among them caused by global trade and style feedback loops. The Freer in Washington, D.C. held a China mania exhibition at the heart of the Impressionist period that addressed the craze for Chinese and Japanese blue and white porcelain. Theorists of museums have long adopted Foucault's concept of the heterotopia to explain the distorted mirrors that museum exhibitions provide societies. In the heterotopia, we see ourselves, but in a glass, darkly. For many who study art museums, 
The distortion has always been for the worse. Museum heterotopias, they lament, concealed colonialism and the subordination of women, excused to the abuses of power, the inequalities of gender and race. Quite apart from the negative social effects of museum heterotopias, museum critics help us understand that we have constructed our collection and exhibition of Impressionism. Because we have always constructed a vision of Impressionism, I want to emphasize we can alter it. We made it so we can remake it. The distortions of the heterotopia can be for the better as well as for the worse. If we want our society to change, then let us construct a heterotopia in the image of our hopes. Let us use the mirroring devices of the museum to create an interpretation of Impressionism that proclaims its place in a united world. Let us recommit to Impressionism's faith in the social good of individual skepticism and ceaseless, restless inquiry, or in the charming malapropism invented by Dickens, let our retrospection be all to the future. Let the vision that museums offer of Impressionism be a vision that shows what we intend to become, that sets our intentions for the future. Let our collecting and our museum practice serve one very simple goal, a vision of an equal human race. Thank you.